Hi, Ken. Hi, Janet. Hi. Thanks, uh, thanks again for, for taking the time to, to join me um, for a discussion about your film, Ken, um, Ultra Violence. Um, I, I saw the film about uh, around like a week ago, and um, as I was just telling you, it's, uh, it sort of stayed with me for a few days after I, I, I finished it. It's, uh, in a way, it's a, it's a very haunting film, but, um, but what's, what's, what's shocking about it in my opinion, is that even if most of it was filmed about 15 years ago, it feels highly relevant today, right? Yeah. I mean, I think um, if we'd made this film, um, I would say if we made this film um, 20 years ago, but we did make this film 20 years ago. It was called Injustice. Um, and Injustice, when it was released, had a huge kind of political impact. Um, what it did was it brought the families together as well. So the, the power of the film and the power of the families together was something which the state couldn't deal with. Um, and of course, the state did make some concessions at the time, uh, but uh, it didn't last very long, a couple of years where it looked like things could improve. And of course, the state did what it always does, which is go back to uh, to its previous position, which, uh, you know, to deny justice. But the film is shocking. Um, I, I think it's partly to do with the fact that uh, since we made injustice, the, the deaths in police custody, police killings, have escalated. Um, we counted a thousand people uh, killed between '69 and '99 in injustice over a 30-year period, and in the 20 years since then, we've had an extra thousand. So that tells me that that's an escalation of the deaths, and we know the figures are going up. That's shocking. Uh, it's shocking that um, Channel Four and BBC refuse to screen injustice. I think that's shocking as well. Um, the material in the film is shocking. To watch people die, to watch Christopher die, to watch Paul die is shocking as well. Um, the fact there was a successful prosecution for manslaughter uh, of uh, Henry Foley in the film, exposed for the first time, that's shocking. Shocking in the sense that nobody ever did anything about that in terms of the media. Why don't, why don't we know about that case, about why they convicted that police officer? Because there could be some important lessons there. Um, but yeah, so the shock is there. And again, about the film, um, it's, it's um, in a way, it's a very haunting, uh, very violent, but also a very poetic film. Mm. The way you chose to to, to make it, Ken, you yeah. um, you are the the narrator of the film, and in the film, you you're talking to your son, right? And you, in a way, addressing the film to your son. Um, yeah. Is it because you think? Our generation uh, won't be saved in a way, but that the future generation if they work mm. and they you know, could actually change things and be saved? Or? Well, I think, I think they are already changing things. They have already started changing things. Um, I mean, it's a letter to my son, but it's a letter from our generation to his generation. It's a letter from us to all of them. And what we wanted to do uh, was to say to them, look, um, there are things in the world which are cruel. There is murder. There is state-sanctioned killings. Uh, there's war, there's violence, there's uh, misogyny, but you can do something about this. And people have done something about this in the past. Personally, I think our generation have failed them because we, we had opportunities. Uh, there are only very few people who actually uh, fight uh, and have the ability to keep fighting uh, that we're in touch with. But of course, many, many people all over the world are continually fighting for justice, continually fighting for the right to life or the right to work or the right to, to breathe or the right to, to do anything. Uh, and it's particularly affecting, obviously, black people and people from the Middle East and Latin America. So the racist element, you know, can't be avoided. Uh, and in the film, what we try to do and say, look, there are things going on. And I've seen with my own eyes, as my son has grown up, he's uh, he, he was born the same year Injustice was released. And so, uh, you know, years later, 18 years later, uh, 19 years later, I can see how his growth has mirrored the growth of, uh, within the youth, of an explosion of anger, of thirst for knowledge, and young people, and you can see this with Black Lives Matter and with the, uh, the movement for um, uh, environmental, um, you know, just against environmental disaster and uh, struggles around gender. They won't tolerate what our generation tolerated, and they're absolutely right. And so I support them 100%. And so the film tries to give them some hope to say, keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting. And, um, and my final question to you for now, Ken, before I, I go to Janet, 
why make this film now? I mean, the footage is about 15 years old. Yeah. Why did you decide to release it now? Well, I think um, in terms of filmmaking, you know, people die in this country. For example, the last figures we have from the um, Independent Police uh, Commission, um, I keep getting their name confused because it's such a, a, a non sequitur. It just doesn't mean anything. But they record the numbers of deaths. They're supposed to in investigate them. And in the year ending in 19, uh, sorry, 2019, there were, I think, 267 deaths in, in police custody or while being in care of, of the police. That's 267. So we could have made the film every year for the past 15 years, 16 years, 17 years. And of course, making films about cases is all well and good. And I really would ask the BBC and Channel 4 and all broadcasters and all international broadcasters to make films about these individual cases, to follow the family campaigns and to investigate properly because the state is not doing it and the media's responsibility is to do it. But the reason we didn't put out a film about cases every year is because our film is reflective. It tries to look at the past and it tries to look at the future. It's not about just the individual cases. It's about how we in the UK as a society have been allowing people to be killed in our name, whether it's in the streets of Brixton or in the streets of Baghdad. It's in our name and many people don't agree with it. And I'm just urging those people to come forward and to support the family struggle. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Janet, um, your brother, Christopher, was, uh, was killed by the police in 1998. Um, I want to ask you in a way about the case and, and if it's ongoing and what's happening now. But before, what, what was very important in the film was that it showed that when one member of a family dies, in a way the whole family dies as well, if you know what I mean. And, and, the, and the, the impact on the lives of the rest of the family, the friends, um, is terrible and ongoing. Could, could you I mean, tell us about, about how difficult that is? Yeah, um, you know, as far as families are concerned, it can divide families, um, you know, because it brings all sorts of different emotions into families, like fear. Um, it, it just raises lots of different emotions in people. Um, some of them, do you know, are not expected whatsoever. And actually dealing, watching your own family die after living such a, a basic life with, you know, with, with no knowledge of these things happening, is it's a shock to your system. So, and people deal with things, you know, like different ways. Um, I've come out more like a fighter because, you know, the, the rage and the anger got me. And um, I just thought, well, you know, how dare they? How can they? You know, who, who are these people type of thing? And that's what it raised in me. And it was it's the, the way that Christopher has been let down after, you know, fighting for the system, for the fighting for this, this country. Um, it raised rage in me, but you know, my, my family have dealt with it differently, you know, because it, it, it brings all, it's like a soul search, it goes right deep into your soul. You ask yourself so many different questions about, you know, you know fear, what's going to happen to me? And, you know, what's going to happen to my children? What, you know, who's around and things like that. So it raises all sorts of different emotions that, and feelings that you've got to, fight within yourself, you know, demons within yourself and get over those and look at the reality of what's happened. And, you know what I mean? Once you do that, as far as I'm concerned, once you do that, there's only one way forward and that's, you know what I mean, to fight for the truth. And also I've spoken to a, a few families that have lost loved ones uh, at the end of the police. Um, and um, they talk about sometimes, and that's, I guess, the state, the media, that is implying a sense of culpability as well, of guiltiness. Uh, at one point, they even ask themselves, not like, oh, maybe he deserved it, but you know, there is this really psychological thing that says maybe he played a part in, in, in his own death, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know, as far as I can see, as far as the media is concerned, they're very, very lazy. Um, the, the narrative gets put out by the state and they just run with the narrative. And it, because they've been brought up in a system where they believe the state does the right thing and the police do the right thing, do you know what I mean? There's not many, you know, they're, they're ordinary people, so they don't question. They just go with what they've been told. And um, 
it t- it takes a lot of unraveling and to you know pushing things forward to get them to change their minds. Like at the beginning, most people looked at Christopher's case and just thought to themselves, "Oh, look how they've dragged this man in and just left him to die on the floor." But then this deeper question that I was asking was, "Why would you do that to another human being?" Yeah. And then you take yourself back to like when you were younger and, you know, if you've got siblings and that, you'd look to see if your parents were looking before you'd, you know, like hit them and that, because you knew with inside that you was in trouble. And um, and I just thought about all those things, put myself into that kind of position, you know, and I just thought to myself, this is not right. There's something more to this. Yeah, you, you would just, as a human being, you saw somebody in difficulty, you would just go and help them. Or you'd get somebody else, and I was questioning why not. And then, um, yeah, I started reading, you know, bits of evidence and that, and you know, the police that had destroyed the clothing, that and um, they destroyed my brother's clo- clo- clothing. They dry cleaned the van. I mean, dry cleaned the officer's clothing and returned it. Cleaned the van. You know, Christopher had another, another missing too. His belt was missing. Yeah, you know, I mean, two, one of the officers had two CS gas canisters sent for destruction. But when I asked about it, they said they were full. So nothing made sense. So I was going a lot deeper than, you know, looking at the horror of my brother lying there on the floor, which, which I could relate to with breathing because I'm asthmatic. Yeah. So I could, I could relate to the, his difficulty in that lot. So I kind of went a lot deeper than what you could see on the surface. Yeah, I was asking myself all these questions, you know what I mean? And and that's that's when I started realizing this is there's more to this case than, do you know what I mean? Than, you know, just bringing a man from the hospital who, yeah, who's had a head injury and then placing him on the floor and trying to make out as if they didn't know. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Ken, in a way, like you've worked with, with bereaved families um, for many years and, uh, What's also what we also see in your film is that the the lies of the police and the state following the death of Christopher of or anyone else that they've killed, and I mean you can see that in France, in Belgium, in the U.S., in Australia, you know this is not a, an accident. You, you can feel it's a pattern that they, they're ready for when they uh, they do these acts. Um, was it shocking to you the level? to the extent they were ready to go to actually lie about how like Christopher or others died? No, it wasn't shocking to me at all. I mean, we, we work with bereaved families, but also we work for, with families who are fighting. And I think that's the important pe- thing that people have to remember. It's the families that fight that are the ones that are leading the struggle. And so that's what we wanted to do. In terms of the way the state behaves, they are trying to protect their very existence because they know for a fact, when people find out the truth of what our government and other governments have been doing, not to their own people only, but to people all over the world, then they are worried and frightened about what the reaction of the people will be. Because I fundamentally believe that if people in the UK actually knew what was happening in their name, then there would be a mass movement against it. This is historical. We can see this happening all over the world. So the media plays a crucial part in this. And I think they're culpable. For me, uh, the state is the police and the judiciary and the government and the politicians, but it's also the media. And I think the, 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 what you were talking about before and what Janet uh, referred to as well, this narrative they play out and control is the big problem because nobody's asking why Christopher got into that van alive and ended up coming out half dead and dying. Nobody asked these questions and all these positions within each case are conveniently forgotten by the media. So they take out the violence. They take out the violence. They take out the actual violence of the police officers and they concentrate on the neglect. And these cases are killings. Officers have used force and so they have to be looked at in this way. And in injustice and in ultraviolence, we look at cases where the police officers have killed and where there's evidence of murder and manslaughter. And these are, are, are not words I throw around lightly, you know. But when you have people murdered in your name, in your country, are you really prepared to accept that? Are you really prepared to let that go for for your own sake, for the sake of your own security and safety? How many are you willing to accept to die? 
At the moment, it's hundreds that die in police custody in the UK, thousands and thousands across the world. Are we going to get to a point where we're going to allow the state to let more people die? In the UK, the government have just passed legislation which allows police immunity from prosecution. Immunity from prosecution. So the state is sanctioning more extensive killings of their own citizens. That's unacceptable and dangerous and very dark, and we have to fight it. You were talking about prosec prosecution. Um, I remember in the film, someone, uh, a family member, I, I think says that uh, the, the focus um, will be um, the importance of a successful prosecution to be used then as a, as a precedent and as a deterrent. Um, mm -hmm. Has it happened yet? And is it still the focus today? And I mean, maybe you can both answer. Um, yeah, I can let Janet go on that one. Okay. No, it's not happened today. Uh, well, you know, apart from the one that Ken mentioned, which we didn't even know about, it was Ken that re revealed that one to us. So it was quite a shock when we heard about it. Um, but no, there's been no successful prosecution. What happens is they go through the motion because what they do is they want the public to believe that there's a system in place to hold the police to account. And what they tend to do is they, they, they leave you know, a space between each death. Do you know what I mean? You know, like years between each death um, and, and the time they get to an inquest or whatever. Do you know, it can be four years. And, um, and they think that people are just gonna go away. People are gonna forget. Do you know what I mean? Perhaps families are gonna get fed up um, you know, because of all the pressure that they put on them and whatsoever. And, um, the, you know, the, the only thing, I've, I've always looked at it this way. It, to me, it's like a wound. If you've got a wound and it's infected, it needs cleaning out. You can't just keep sticking elastoplasts on, elastoplasts on, um, because it just gets worse and worse and worse. And this is what we're seeing, you know, time and time and time and time again, more and more deaths. And... The, the state is learning from each case how to, to cover up more and more and more. And, and, you know, it's got that bad now that there are actually blaming on the victims. You know, like excited delirium, you know, well, he was running about, he was doing this, that, and the other, he got himself really excited and he died. That's the kind of, you know, what they're playing out nowadays. And it's like they move the goalposts all the time you know, to give them more power, yeah, by looking at the case previous, do you know what I mean, they then decide to move the goalposts, and they're all within it, the coroners, do you know, the IPCC, the Crown Prosecution, the whole lot of them, yeah, and the horror is allowing these families to go through this process, because at the beginning, you're so naive, and you believe that, you know, there's a system in place, and they actually, it's torture for them to put families through this, know for well that there isn't. So like, your brother was killed, was he 20, 22 years ago, right, Janet? Um, do you, do you, and you've, you've gone through, as you said, many, many sort of, you know, CPC, uh, CPS and, and, and the rest. And so do you believe there's such thing as equality in the justice system in the UK? Not at all. Um, I think we were led to believe at one time that there was, do you know what I mean? But there's, I've been through every single process, you know, and not just once, you know, I've been three times I've been through processes where, you know, they were illegally spying on me and then they swapped my brother's body for a seven-year-old woman and hid him in the mortuary for 11 years. But each time they dealt with it exactly the same. Mm. Um, so to me, there's, there's an, it's, it's made me realise that us as ordinary people don't have the power. The state is there to protect itself. Do you know what I mean? And really, from what I looked at the beginning as these big, brave people, um, I think there's, there's just a lot of people that tend to pass this over like a hot potato, don't want to deal with it and too frightened to deal with it, um, you know, because they, in case they lose their home, lose the car, all the material things that they give them comfort that we have lost. We lost all that. Do you know what I mean? The safety of being in a society, all that is, is more important to them than, you know what I mean? The honesty and the truth and 
justice for you know the, these young men that's been murdered. Um, yeah, and you know I think that's that's where I come from. You you were talking about before the in a way that the state and the media denying in a way that such thing can happen as police violence and you show this in the film and I think at one point someone also says that we have to remember that that a policeman is a man is a man with a uniform so a policeman can also kill and yeah. and uh, recently the French president Macron when um, a question was put to him about police violence in the demonstrations of the gilets jaunes the yellow vest yeah. Uh, terrible violence. People have lost eyes, have lost their hands, people have become paralyzed because of police violence. Macron said something, he said something like, how can you talk to me about police violence in the French democracy? This is just not possible. He just said this is not possible, even if we have the images, right? Yeah. So that's also something, I guess, that you show in the film and that we have to, when you change the narrative, right? And show the people that, yes, a man with a uniform can also kill you. I think it was Janet who said that in the film. I mean, what we try to do in the film, and I, it's not just Macron, but of course, Boris Johnson and every other European and international leader tries to deflect away from the truth. And they will say these things, even though they're blatantly and clearly not true. And the thing they do and why they say these things is because they know that the majority of people want to believe the lies. They want to believe the lies, and that's the battle we have. Until people are confronted with the truth, until they're told, this is not just about something that the state is doing in your name. You are culpable. One of the most heartwarming um, slogans on the streets that I saw in this past year in terms of the Black Lives Matter movements was the slogan, uh, uh, which I've forgotten by now. Oh, sorry, silence is violence. Okay, it was really memorable. It's just such a strong thing. Silence is violence. And if people are silent about the violence, then they're encouraging it. So I would people, I would urge people to seek out the truth, not to believe their leaders, because their leaders tell lies. But people have to have some hope that there is possibility for change. And I think people are aware that Steve McQueen has just made a film called Mangrove Nine. Uh, I'm very familiar with that case. We made films about these uh, cases of self-defense before. In, in, you know, in the 1970s in, in the UK, if you called a police officer a liar, you would get sent to jail. It was impossible, impossible for the population to believe that officers were capable of lying. And the Mangrove Nine case proved that officers were lying. The whole country then realized it was true. And police officers were not trusted from that day. In the 1980s, you had the case of Bradford 12, 12 young Asian men who made uh, uh, Molotov cocktails to defend themselves against the far right who were marching into Bradford. They were accused of terrorism, went to trial, found not guilty by an all-white jury. They established the right of self-defense. And so with the Stephen Lawrence case in, in the 90s as well, police racism. So you can see over the past 50 years, police lies, police framing, police racism. It's all been fought for, all been won by campaigners, by families, by people who have been affected and by people who stand by them, yeah? The people, the good people who stand by them and who won't accept it. Now we're at the final hurdle in the UK. Officers can kill and we will win. Maybe not in my lifetime, which is why the film is there for the next generation to say that, you know, it's up to you now. We've done what we have can, and people have fought, and we have had victories. And so that's what the film tries to do. Thanks. Uh, my final question would be about the film, I mean, maybe to you both. Uh, so is that what the film aims to do? And is that what the film, I mean, is that what you'd like the film to do, to in a way break the wall of silence, but also show that there is resistance, right? And there is positives, you know, out of the, the, the darkness. Is that something you wish the film through, through public and community screenings can, can achieve? And I mean, maybe you can start, Ken, and you will finish with Janet. Sure. Um, all we've done in the film is we've taken the voice of the families and put it with our own uh, ideas and, and try to make uh, a change. It's a collective memory. It's a call to arms. It's a demand from our generation to really be honest and come out, and it's a, and it's a it's it's a warning and a plea to the youth of today not to give up, 
to never ever give up because the only things that have happened in history which has benefited the whole of humanity is when people have fought and they've won, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Malcolm X, uh, whether it's uh, Palestine, whether it's anything, people fight. And when people fight against the state, they win. Yeah, well, where I'm, I mean, I've just had this thing come up on my computer just now, police murder in Canada with knuckle plated gloves. Yeah, that's just come up on my, um, my laptop just now. Now, one of the things that was so important to raise the profile of these deaths was actually showing people, um, because you can tell somebody something and they can go away and they can just basically, oh, that's really bad. And they'll make that your issue and they will just walk away and think nothing of it the next day because part of them doesn't really believe it. And I think visually, it's only when we are in a time of, or, or when we see traumatic things, unfortunately, that makes people open their eyes to things. You know, I mean, if, you, if you're telling somebody something about, um, you know, going on a holiday, they, they can visualize all that, yeah? But if you tell somebody that, you know, my, my brother's been murdered by the police and whatsoever, it will just go to the back of their heads and they won't believe you. So, and especially with the way that the state was dealing with Christopher's case, I had to make a, a decision against my family's wishes, you know, <laughs> fuming, you know, my brother was fuming with me, but um, that Christopher's case needed to be shown. People needed to see it for what it is. And that was our our power, our our strength, do you know what I mean, to, to battle these people, do you know, with the truth and put the truth right in front of their faces as well. And I think that's why they've never come back. We, you know, the Ken's films, because they do, once you, they see it themselves, you bring it to the forefront of their mind, they can't deny it. Do you know what I mean? So I think, you know, these films are so important, no matter how traumatic people believe or think that they are, or how traumatic they are, it is so important, especially in this day and age, to forearm people to the possibilities of what the state does. Um, because things are getting really difficult, things are going to get harder and people need to be prepared to, you know, if people are going to go into the battle, they'll go in armed rather than just going in there, you know, and expecting to stand there at a protest and everything be peaceful and, you know, and I think it's things that is truth and reality that really kind of wakes people up to, to the battle ahead. Thanks, Janet. And thanks, Ken. Uh, You're welcome. It's, it's a hugely important film you, you've made and been part of, so thank you. Thank you very much. We hope uh, people will see it soon and uh, take it and use it. It's a weapon that I give to the people to use.